Wow. Thank you. <clears throat> what an introduction. If that doesn't make you nervous, I don't know what will, or speechless. Um, I'm going to take you on a journey through space and time, through um, the wisdoms of our history to the mysteries of our future, through our physical universe and through our digital universe. I hope you like quotes because there's a few more coming up. This one isn't so new, it's 500 years old. And <clears throat> I want to begin this story by talking about one of my distant relatives, an ancestor. He was a Danish nobleman, nobleman um, alchemist and astronomer. His name was Tycho Brahe, the son of Ute Brahe and Beate Bille. He was the last one of the large naked eye, the, the big naked eye astronomers, which means that he did his discoveries without the help of modern optics like telescopes. He discovered and um, wrote about things like supernovas, comets, and planetary um, uh, motions with his naked eye. And before, or in the time when people, a lot of people still thought that the, the Earth was flat and in the center of the universe. So this is what he looked like, um, almost what he looked like. There's a facelift in oil paint there. Fo uh, Photoshop wasn't invented at this time. <clears throat> he got into uh, an argument in his 20s about how to solve a mathematical formula. And <clears throat> they couldn't really agree, so they, um, they solved it with a sword feud, and he lost his nose. So he actually had a brass nose for the rest of his life. And I just, I think we look alike. You can, you can tell that we're related, right? <laughs> Let's move to our universe, to present time. This is not a, an image of our universe. This is only showing the 50,000 nearest galaxies that we now know of. How is this different to, to Tycho's everyday life, to his mission as an astronomer? Well, it's of course different in very many different ways, but there's one fundamental difference. If you think about Tycho and his research, he was able to keep up with what every other astronomer discovered in his time and wrote down and distributed. He was also able to read about every previous discovery ever done in the field of astronomy. Today, there's no astronomer that can possibly do that. The pace of new information and new discoveries is just too fast. So if the previous image was the 50,000 nearest galaxies in our universe, then what is this? image showing us. Does anyone know? It's a network map of the internet, the digital universe that we call the internet. So I like to call myself an explorer, just like Tycho Brahe, just not as famous or rich as he was. Um, but just like him, I used to have the ability to know everything in the field. There was a time in, in the digital universe when you were able, as a futurist or digital innovator, to actually track every large movement, every big new innovation. About two years ago, it struck me that there's, it's no longer possible to keep up with the pace. I cannot be the digital oracle that knows everything about the internet and, and digital innovation that I used to be. So the strategy 
going forward had to be adjusted. I had to start thinking and research about things that really were relevant to me and to my customers and clients. So why is this a, an important analogy? Here's the next quote. I'm going to let you read it. This is, this catches the essence of what I want to communicate to business leaders um, in this forum, in the world at, at large. And um, I think it's fundamentally important that we understand this. The world we knew is gone. That doesn't mean that the brick and mortar world we know is gone. But the way that we think about our needs going forward, that's fundamentally different. Of course, when John Wyndham wrote this, uh, those very powerful words, he wasn't thinking about our connected society. He was writing about a world where a strange um, cosmic radiation made every people on Earth blind. And then they were hunted by carnivorous plants called the triffids that ate them. So that's kind of, I, I recommend you to read the book and skip the movie. <laughs> so but if the world we knew is gone, what is the world really like? Let's go um, through time and space in the universe back to, to Earth and to Calgary. Or is it? It's actually a remix. This is Gothenburg, where I come from, remixed with Calgary. Because the cities are quite similar. Calgary is twice as big as Gothenburg, but we both have a tower. We both have a few unmistakable buildings. And we do get the opportunity to run into large wild animals in the middle of the street from time to time. So, what formed our cities? We all know about industrialization. I like to talk about that in a term called the first machine age. And if we look at West Sweden, we came from an economy with agriculture and fishing, and it became shipyards and automotive industries. Alberta has come from um, agriculture and logging, if I've done my homework correctly, towards uh, fossil fuels and um, supporting industries at its epicenter. What were the underlying causes of industrialization? What was the idea that really took us to where we are now? If we look at the first machine age, it started in the late 18th century with the introduction of the steam engine, and then followed thousands, no millions, of innovations that did one thing, they had one thing in common. They synthesized muscle power, physical abilities beyond what humans or animals could perform. This is what has driven the first machine age to the point where we are today. I want to give you one example, the car. It's a very good example, so let's just look at that. Bobby is absolutely away. With Audi, this RS7 accelerates now. It's being controlled by the intelligence. A great line through turn. You can hear the uh, 560 horsepower being unleashed through three and four, and now it's the Parabolica. This is a fantastic shot from our helicopter that is tracking the car. Heavy, heavy braking as the car reaches 220 kilometers an hour. The car comes to a stop now. That was truly awesome. Yeah, that's an awesome car. If you look at it from a physical abilities perspective, that car does things that none of us could do or any animal could do. So that's a good um, example of an innovation from the first machine age. If you're not familiar with a guy called Ian Morris, 
and his research on social development. I really recommend picking up this book. It's 700 pages or so about the social development from the last ice age up until today. And Morris's contribution is really interesting. It's a numerical index of social development. So he's measured numerically from one time to another how a society can perform uh, in that specific time period. Why the West rules for now. So if we look at the numerical index, it looks like this. It took us about 10,000 years to reach 50 points on the scale. And then came the steam engine and the first mach machine age or industrialization as we call it. And you can see the peak, it's really, it's a peak. Um, if we look at it on another scale, this is a logarithmic scale. Um, so it's exponential, you go from 10 to 100 to 1000. What's really interesting with this curve is that it's exponential on an exponential scale. So you've got exponential exponentiality, which is just too hard to understand, so let's not talk more about that. But you can see that something really happens um, <clears throat> with the introduction of an innovation that synthesizes our bodies, our physical abilities. What you can do with this now is to make a prediction into the future. Where are we going? And um, I took like a minute or two of one of uh, Morris's speech that we're going to, to look at. One of the things I particularly liked about my numerical index of social development was that having drawn this thing, you can then start playing around with projections, projecting it forward, saying, what will happen? And of course, the projections, all they tell you really is how, how sensible are the assumptions you're making here, and what will happen under certain assumptions. So I tried just making what I think very conservative assumptions. I said, what will happen if Western and Eastern social development continue to rise at the same speed across the next 100 years, at the same point that they rose across the last 100 years? Which I think is an implausibly conservative assumption, but what would happen if that were the case? And what happens is what you see in this graph here. And again, the blue line is Western social development. The red line is Eastern social development. What we see here is that the lines cross. The blue Western line, uh, 2000, where I stopped my story, clearly higher. You go a bit to the right, the red Eastern line catches it up. And it's going to catch it up, and you, you might want to make a note of this. It's going to catch it up in the year 2103. That is what my index says. Which I've got to say, this is like the perfect prediction. Because um, everybody always says, you get in the predicting game, you must be precise, so people know whether it's come true or not. And they also say, it must play out after you're dead. Um, <laughs> and 21, I think, absolutely perfect. So he's a funny guy, he's also very smart. But he talks about when the East overtakes the West, which I think is interesting, but it's, that's another discussion altogether. Let's look at the numbers, his numerical index. Where are we going in 2103? So we will end up somewhere between four and 6,000 points of the scale. And what we need to bear in mind is that it took us 10,000 years to reach 50 points. It then took us 250 years to reach another 900 or 1,000 points. And in less than 100 years, we're going to reach around 5,000 points on the social development curve, if this is correct. Very interesting. How are we going to get there? I mean, we all need to do a lot of things if we're going to make, get to those 5,000 points. These two guys wrote another book, um, Eric Brynolfsson and Andrew McAfee, that I think maybe you should read this one instead. It's shorter, and it actually takes uh, up a lot of the points that Maurice is, makes in his book. So this is a good book. The Second Machine Age. We're actually already entered the Second Machine Age. And I wanted to uh, give you an idea what the Second Machine Age is all about by revisiting that little video we saw before with the car. Did you notice something strange with the car? 
Let's look at it again. Once everything is safe, Bobby is absolutely away. The first piloted car here at the Hockenheim ring with Audi. This RS7 accelerates now towards the north curve of turn one. You can see that. Look, it's being steered by nobody. It's being controlled by the intelligence. A great line through turn one, heading up now towards turn two. Just look at the speed. We're approaching 180 kilometers an hour as we go into turn two. Brilliant braking, all assured and controlled. You can hear the uh, 560 horsepower being unleashed through three and four. And now it's the Parabolica. As the tens of thousands of fans here witness history in the making from Audi piloted driving. This is a fantastic shot from our helicopter that is tracking the car. Now, this is going to be crucial. Heavy, heavy braking as the car reaches 220 kilometers an hour and brakes now for the hairpin. This car is being driven by technology, by intelligence, and look at that line as it's straight through. Turns nine and 10 absolutely perfectly, taking exactly the optimum line that you would expect a top, top racing driver to take. It has been precise as it heads towards the start-finish line. The absolute optimum lap as the car comes to a stop now. That was truly awesome. Yeah, so now that was truly awesome from a different perspective than before, right? This car was not programmed to drive around Hockenheim. Um, it was programmed to see the world and understand it as we do, take decisions, learn from its experiences. It's an example of an innovation in the second machine age that we call machine learning. So if we take a closer look at the second machine age, the first age, was about synthesizing physical abilities, muscle power. The second machine age is all about synthesizing mental abilities, your brain. Think about that. Is there some things, some innovations that we already know of that does our thinking better than we do, that can do things that we normally do with our minds? Of course there are. There are cal calculators. I think probably most of you in here would say that a calculator does calculation better than you do with your minds. Same with exact me memory, perfect memory. The human mind has a, a really great storage capacity, but it's not very accurate, as exact as a computer memory. And visualizing things, sorting data, sorting huge amounts of data and visualizing them. That's another mental ability um, that's already synthesized. But those are all structured mental things, right? There's a great deal of structure to it. Driving a car, that's not really a lot of structure to that. Anything can happen, and the machine needs to respond to that anything. So. The fundamental innovation in the second machine age is the computer, of course. So I did a study of our relationships with computers and the mean um, distance between any people, any person in our part of the world and any computer, any personal computer, over time. And something very unsurprising comes out. But it's still interesting. The machine man distance is approaching zero. So when the Apple II came out in 1977, you could probably find um, the, the accurate mean distance between any, any person and a, and a computer. I didn't do that because I didn't see the point of it. Um, conceptually, I said it's probably like 300 kilometers doesn't need to be exactly true. If we fast forward to 1985, new press processors made computers much cheaper, and they started to be much more popular. In 1998, Apple introduced the iMac. It brought them back to profitability, 
And it also made home computers much more uh, popular. So we look at this graph. In the 90s, computer sales really started to take off. And then in the mid 2000s, something happens to the computing world. It's the introduction of the smartphone. And again, Apple is leading the way in terms of usability and, and uh, popularity. So 30 centimeters between the brain and your computing device. And actually, it's approaching zero, and it will go beyond zero. We're looking right now. There's been an anticipated commercial launch of Google, Google Glass next year. I actually think that it's not going to happen. After using the prototype for um, almost a year, I think it's too intrusive. It hurts my personal brand, wouldn't you say? Yeah, someone's nodding. It's simply too rude to wear um, around people. But something else will come in its place. And that will be the next thing I want to talk about. Because this is a very good example of something we, we call ubiquitous computing. So there's me with Google Glass. Ubiquitous computing is the third wave of computing. So you know the first one. I'm actually going to show you a video, and I'll talk while we, while we watch it. This is Microsoft's um, view of the world five years from now. Oops. So ubiquitous computing is the third wave of computing. The first one was mainframes. You remember those old big computers where you had many users on one computer. The second wave of computing was the PC boom where you had one user for one computer. Ubiquitous computing is the age we're going into now, where you have many integrated computers that serve one user. U Ubiquitous computing is made up by three cornerstones. So it's, one is called tiles, like the one we see right now. It's a small device, often wearable device. Second uh, cornerstone, the second piece of the puzzle, is called boards. And those are more like the ones we see right now, the iPad or tablets in general. The third piece is called um, panels. And panels can be entire walls, like the one we see here. So this is how Microsoft thinks about the future five years from now. When we get all this technology into our lives, that technology must start to understand us but much better than it does today, right? Technology is still quite stupid. That's the next research field that's really big in the second machine age. And it's called cognitive computing. The best um, example, I, I think, right now of cognitive computing is something that you've probably seen before. It's called Watson. So let's take a brief look at Watson. Two and a half years ago, IBM introduced the world to a new era of computing embodied in something called Watson. Since then, we've applied that idea, those technologies, to understand this massive wave of information in the marketplace called big data. I believe Watson has the potential to transform many industries. There's lots of data out there. Now the trick is, how do you get intelligence out of it, not just noise? Most of the data that is available today is unstructured data. It's text, written words, spoken words. Watson represents a way to look at all this data and extract the needle in the haystack, the key insight that's useful. So <clears throat> Watson is one of these concepts out there right now in the second machine age that 
utilizes two core concepts. And those are cognitive computing and machine learning. And cognitive computing, conceptually, isn't that difficult. It's about making a computer that understands human language and intent. That's what it does. So it can read text and understand what we're trying to say. Or, for that matter, listen to what we're saying and understand what we want to do. Machine learning is taking that into account. So machine learning is about measuring what the computer thinks we want it to do and whether it's successful or not. And if it's unsuccessful, it reprograms itself to be more successful the next time. We call it experience. It's the same thing, machine learning. These systems become better at doing things. Those synthesized mental abilities becomes better than our own. So Watson, for example, is better at diagnosing cancer than the human doctor is today. And it's not really that strange once it starts to understand human language and intent. Remember what I told you about not being able to keep up with my field, the digital universe? Oncology produces 160 hours of reading a week in new discoveries. Who is going to be able to read 160 hours of new discoveries in their field and do their work? It's impossible, but not to Watson. So Watson can take that into account. And when it's important for a doctor, they can, it can pull it out and present that presentation, that information. Are you familiar with this term, B2B? No reaction? Yes? Are you sure? Okay, so I'll skip this brain-to-brain uh, -brain communication. This is another really interesting field, um, where, which is really scary and really, really funny. And it's, it's the field where machines start to go beyond understanding our language and our intent. Machines start to understand our brains. These two guys did a very interesting experiment. The first one is wearing an EEG cap, which registers his, uh, his thoughts, his intentions to do something. A computer transfers it into magnetic stimulation two kilometers away to the other guy. And what they're doing is they're playing a computer game together. So the first guy sees a computer screen with a spaceship that he wants to shoot, but he doesn't have a keyboard. He can only think really hard that he wants to shoot that spaceship. The signals are read from his mind, transferred two kilometers away to the other guy who has the keyboard but no screen. So he has no idea when to fire, but he does it accurately anyway. So this is mind control. If anyone thought we wouldn't have mind control, we have mind control now. This is what their innovation looks like. Um, I think this is really interesting. It's really scary, but it's making um, researchers help people with disabilities to get much more mobile again. In another experiment, researchers took millions of seconds of random video from YouTube and built a great video library which they showed to subjects and recorded over a hundred different areas of the brain as they showed the pictures. Over time, this system learned which areas of the brain that reacts to different types of images. Now, researchers are able to read those signals and reconstruct video data directly from your brain. So it's possible to read a person's mind visually. Is that scary? No. Maybe a little. Another team of researchers did the same thing, but they, sub they had their subjects concentrate on text, the word neuron, and they could read from looking at activity in the brain back the letters, neural. 
Interesting. So now we know a little bit more about what's going on in the digital world, and just a little bit more, because it is really impossible to go to a conference or even sit 24 hours a day and try to understand what's going on here. Since I've been told that you want to go away from this conference with something tangible, uh, something that you can actually apply to your businesses, I want to expose you to my latest idea. This might not be a good one, but I'm, I'm going to try it. So um, it's all about predicting the future. Can you predict the future? Do you know what the end of this quote is? It's Abraham Lincoln, by the way. The best way to predict the future is to create it. If you look back at people who have tried to predict the future, they've been mostly been very wrong, so I'm not going to do that. I'm going to talk about how you create the future, uh, my view of how to create a future in this environment that we're in right now. So it's an idea that I call avertive innovation. It's probably not right to call it my idea um, because it's, it's more like a flavor of a strain of beliefs that run thousands of years back in our society. The core of avertive ideas is that by doing certain things individually or as a group, you can avert the apocalypse. So these ideas during thousands of, of, of years have become very popular in culture, of course in philosophy, and in religion. And you know why? Because they work, right? There haven't been any big apocalypse, really. So people, it's a good idea to start thinking avertively because it, the, earth, the, the world will not end. So when we start thinking about innovation, most people think about the entrepreneur who is driven by great gains. If you find this idea, if you build this company, you will gain a lot. What we can learn from history and avertive ideas is really the key to motivation. Because established businesses really have a lot to lose, right? But we go into innovation thinking that we're doing it because we're going to gain a lot. But it's a research fact that we hate losing twice as much as we love winning. So what companies really need to do is to start thinking about how they can create innovation processes that makes them more invulnerable how they will not face their own apocalypse. And the motivation to success in such ideas is fundamentally different than the entrepreneur who starts with only an idea and two bare hands. So uh, I'm actually thinking that I might write a book about this so I can come back in a year, make it two years, not one, and, and talk about this um, if someone likes it. We'll see. I want to end by talking about three projects where this has been part of the idea, at least. Oops. Let's start with Electrolux. So they, the, connect, the connected refrigerator has been ridiculed for about 10 years as a stupid device, stupid home appliance. Why would we need connectivity for the fridge? So when Electrolux came to us and said, hey, we want a concept line with all our home appliances, large home appliances connected, Whew, we started thinking about what are these things going to do? I mean, a tweeting oven isn't really that much, it's not really useful. It doesn't add value. But when you start thinking about it, how can you add value to, connectiv to, to home appliances by connectivity? So if you have a family buying new home appliances, what's the best value you can add 
to refrigeration and heating and so on. And we came out with time. To give time to the family, is there something, I mean, if you do innovation, if you do, um, if you talk about improving the company's um, businesses by adding value, the first thing you ask yourself is, can we save people's lives? That's a very good added value to any service or product, like the self-braking car, right? That's a great added value. You can save lives. Time is such a value. It's something that everyone wants. You would like to have less time in the kitchen and more with your family. So we started to add things like a camera in the oven so you can watch how that bread is baking from the sofa and not having to run into the kitchen and open the oven. We built a smart hub that communicates with the oven. So um, you can put your steak in there, the, the thermometer, um, your potatoes on the hub with water in it, and then it will cook the entire dish for you. So it will start boiling the water when it knows that um, your roast beef or whatever you're making will be ready. No need for you to run into the kitchen and do all these manual things. So that's one example. It's called Electrolux Imagine, and I have no idea when it's coming out to market, unfortunately. Here's another project. Cash was king, right? As we go into mobile payments and mobile banking, cash becomes more and more like the, um, you know, the um, black sheep of the family that you can't really get rid of. So we try this uh, in the Nordics to find out what's, the really, what's really the big problem with uh, peer-to-peer payments and mobile banking. So one of the big problems is that you don't know, you don't even know your own bank account number. You less so know your friend's bank account's numbers. So all the big banks in the Nordics got together with system providers and made a system where bank accounts are coupled with phone numbers. So now you can send money as easy as a text message because all you need to know is the phone number to the person you want to send cash to. And the transfer is done immediately. So it's the quickest transferring system, bank system, between different banks in the Nordics. Best story I have from this is my son. He's seven, and he runs his own business of selling his drawings. And no one has cash anymore. But now he's got a Swish account. So he can show people, look, you can buy my drawing, pay with Swish, and it will go directly into my savings account. And he makes more money than me. No, not really, but. <laughs> so last one speaks for its, didn't speak for itself. Last one Are you tired of itself. always missing those deliveries when you're not at home? Yeah, uh -huh. always, yeah. And you may be feeling the same way, so you may want to consider investing in a Volvo in Seriously? the future. Web producer Alexandra Bahu is here now to explain. Imagine your car acting as a pickup and drop off zone for packages. You never have to miss a delivery again. That's the idea behind the Rome delivery concept from Volvo Cars. The automaker has demonstrated with a trial group of customers a new service that would let consumers have their online orders delivered right to their car, no matter where they are. When ordering items online, Volvo car owners in the group were able to choose their vehicle as a delivery option. The driver was then notified via smartphone when a delivery company wanted to pick something up or drop something off at their car. Once accepted, Volvo's digital key technology let the delivery person open the car and leave the package, all of which is trackable on the driver's smartphone. The digital key then disappears after the delivery. Now, the pilot program, Volvo says, is one example of how the company is exploring the potential of connected cars to help simplify our lives. To read more about Rome delivery, head to our homepage, wxyz.com. For 7 Action News, I'm Alexandra Bahu. What do you guys think? Crazy, huh? Actually, I think that's actually genius. You love it. That is just it. stupid enough to be genius. <laughs> stupid enough. I like that I, I, description. Know, whenever... Yeah, so if we talk about personal brands, if, um, if this would be the essence of my personal brand, that's just stupid enough to be genius, I'd be very happy with that. You can exchange stupid for simple, right? That's all we're looking for, simplicity. Thank you. That's all.